Good afternoon. Well I'm Bhavna from Bistock 360. I work as a customer relationship manager. I'm here quickly to introduce the next two speakers. So um, we have uh, Paul Larson and Valerie Rob. So Paul Larson is a principal program manager for the Microsoft Corporation in Redmond. Uh, I'm, I'm sure all of you know him very well. Uh, Paul also leads the host integration engineering team to deliver and support Azure, Bistock, SQL, Office, and Windows connectors to existing IBM systems. Today, he's also joined by Valerie Robb. Hi, Valerie. Valerie has worked with the host integration server product since 1998. That's a long time ago. She has experience working with HIS as a support engineer, escalation engineer, tester, and program manager. Her passion is uh, helping the enterprise customers use the Windows platform to gain access to programs and data on IBM mid-range and mainframe computers. Uh, she also loves writing COBOL programs. Yes. <laughs> I do. So together, they present to you today hybrid integration with legacy systems. So please welcome both of them. Thank you. So a little bit about uh, introductions. Probably should have said something. Hey, you know, change is important, and we embrace change at Microsoft. And in fact, Valerie and I have embraced change for eight months now. Seems longer. Maybe it's nine months. We've been uh, co-owning, oh, thank you very much, the both uh, BizTalk server and host integration server and the line of business adapters and enterprise single sign-on. So all the stuff that is tied to the BizTalk server on-prem license, uh, that's, that's Valerie and I now. So we're the PMs for BizTalk. Woohoo! The way I see BizTalk, BizTalk is the integration server for Microsoft. It's our on-prem solution. And so it, it connects to all the line of business systems that matter. In fact, uh, Microsoft IT, as you might know if you've attended this, this event um, in the last couple of years, is one of the biggest uh, Microsoft customers as well. Um, we've got a lot of large institutions, organizations that run BizTalk for their mission critical enterprise tier one applications. And many of our customers are running BizTalk Server in uh, Azure, IaaS, VM infrastructure, as well as uh, Amazon Web Services and other clouds, like uh, IBM's, using infrastructure. And it connects to the, the top five line of business systems. Microsoft, of course, like SQL Server as a data store. Also IBM, uh, TIBCO, SAP, and Oracle. And one of the key things that it offers is, is a Technologies at all levels of the stack. So it has orchestration, kind of a workflow with the rules engine. It has great tracking of messages. It has adapters for all the important systems. And it has uh, XML document interchange. But we also have uh, built into BizTalk a pipeline for JSON, XML, XML to JSON. So it's modern as well in terms of the message format that it supports. And then key at the very bottom there in the center are some accelerators that are combinations of uh, templates, um, X XML templates and adapters, healthcare, uh, ResetNet, and Swift. Things that you actually can't get uh, anywhere else. We made a big investment in BizTalk Server 2016, and I'll call out a couple things here. One in particular is an add-on to a BizTalk Server, which is the uh, Logic App Adapter. I used it earlier in the demo, in that first phase of the keynote demo, uh, to get a credit card authorization and hold. We use that adapter. Also, uh, I'll call out there um, a bunch of work we did around security in terms of new uh, encryption schemes and uh, for authentication and, and encryption. Another large aspect of BizTalk Server License is host integration server for IBM platform interoperability. And it has a set of bi-directional components or services or adapters. Some of the adapters run in BizTalk, some run in SQL Server, others are just .NET clients and servers. And where we differentiate in terms of host integration server and their adapters versus third party things you might get from uh, companies such as MuleSoft is we actually implement the IBM adapters all the way down to the wire. So we write our own protocol clients and servers either by devising the protocols, using IBM documentation or license, or using industry standards like we do for DB2. And there was a big investment in HS 2016 as well. In particular, I'll call your attention to the right side. We developed our own MQ client, and that was primarily because we couldn't get a licensed MQ client from, from IBM that can work in Azure for Logic Apps. 
So the Logic App Connector for MQ uses their own Microsoft devised MQ protocol client. I took that same client and made it available to your use in the .NET framework and also as an underpinning to the new, um, not quite fully, but substantially rewritten MQSC adapter. One of the most popular adapters in BizTalk is the MQ client. So it can use the IBM client or the Microsoft client now. And then for DB2 and Informix, we wrote a, an entirely new adapter as well, and it's the one I'm using today in my demos. Okay, really important to know, lifecycle. Product support lifecycle for BizTalk Server 2013 R2 and 2013, uh, the two of them, is that's <laughs> not very far away. Just over a month away, so about five weeks. So it's really, really important that we talk to you as enterprise customers and partners and make sure we're starting to plan, if not move, your workloads from the older BizTalk to the new BizTalk. In order to make that possible, our MSID department, who I said is one of our largest BizTalk customers, has developed a tool, toolkit, a migration tool. And we have that available in a built version on OneDrive and also the source code in GitHub. It really does help to migrate from an existing BizTalk server 2010, 2013, 2013R2 to 2016 installation. It'll dehydrate the artifacts, move those to a new target server, rehydrate the artifacts, get you up and running a lot quicker. In the audience today and here all week, we have a couple of uh, development managers, Sanjeev and Sham. You guys here? You want to stand up for a moment? There's Sanjeev. And Shams and back, hello. And collectively, they own BizTalk Server, Enterprise Connectors, key portions of Logic Apps. And so they're our, our engineering guys. They represent the, the engineering team. Also, we have some professional field engineers. Um, Samuel, you out there? Here. Here's Samuel Kasberg. Do we have any other of your coworkers, like Safiala here? Any of the other guys? So we have some of our support engineers. Yeah. Yep, we have some of our support engineers here as well. Yeah. Thank you, guys. And Really the focus for the product team and the PMs and our field and our partners is just this, helping customers migrate their existing workloads and deploy brand new workloads on BizTalk Server 2016, Host Integration Server 2016, line of business adapters. So be sure and uh, talk to us and tell us how that's going and see if we can help you. Similarly, Host Integration Server has a life cycle. It's a little bit later because it shipped after uh, BizTalk Server 2016 or 2013 rather, and it's due out just in January of next year. Important thing to note, you can use the HIS adapters for BizTalk, like MQ, DB2, with the new BizTalk server or the old BizTalk server. We have customers doing that as well. But it only gives you like another six months. All right, so what have we been doing since we shipped BizTalk server 2016? Continual improvement, internet speed, Chip, 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 chip. About every six months, we do a feature pack. Uh, last year, we talked about feature pack one, where we offered the first look at de defining and deploying an application lifecycle management through Visual Studio Team Services, VSTS. We also talked about the ability to use uh, alternatives to, to BAM for analytics, application insights, and Power BI, really cool features. And I mentioned this in, in the fall conference. My, some of my favorite features are the analytic features over BizTalk now. And then also an industry standard web interface for administration. And those were really well received. So we follow those up in the fall with a feature pack two for BizTalk Server 2016. And let me just call out here in the upper right side, new functionality for BizTalk, like these feature packs between releases. These are licensed for customers with enterprise assurance, EAs. That allows you to get the new updates as part of your license to BizTalk, or if you're deploying BizTalk server as VMs in Azure and you're using an enterprise agreement for Azure, you get to use the feature packs. If you're not licensing BizTalk in one of those two ways, you can't use the feature packs. It's outside the license. Just what our guys want us to do. And Sean, you're here. Where's Sean at? I think he's back in the green room. We have one of our licensing experts here with us this week, so if you'd like to ask some questions or you want to challenge him on our approach for this, I'll introduce you. Although I, I do support what Microsoft does here. All right, so in feature pack two, we added support for, in the adapter for service bus, support for service bus premium and partitioning. And that's actually what I was using today in, in my demos, um, service bus premium and partitioned queues. We also had support for TLS 1.2 for encrypted auth. 
and connections. Uh, you can publish orchestrations through API management. So we're now participating in API management from BizTalk directly. And then lastly, support for event hubs, both as an adapter to send and receive messages to event hubs, as well as for sending analytics to event hubs. And so in that last keynote scenario, where Matt and Derek and I were processing the order, uh, we actually could have had BizTalk server return the response directly to event hubs. We were returning it to uh, service bus, which then passed it on to event hubs. So we could have done that from BizTalk as well. All right, so announcing today that we are developing BizTalk Server 2016 Feature Pack 3. Woohoo! The focus is a little bit different than the previous feature packs. We're going to look at it from three aspects. One is compliance. Big for our UK and EU customers, those of you out here, is support for GDPR. So we are stating that BizTalk Server with FuturePack 3 and then the follow-on CU, which I'll talk about in a moment, is compatible with GDPR. Also, the US correlation of that is FIPS. And then we also have support for the US accessibility. So we're at the base level accessibility when we deliver FuturePack 3 and the follow-on cumulative update. And then we also have on the right side a little bit of administrative work in terms of um, configuring endpoints, where we've added support for the final uh, feature set for advanced scheduling all the way down to uh, hours, minutes, and seconds. So we have the ability to configure BizTalk much as you're familiar with uh, Logic App actions. But the key focus of, of FeaturePack 3 is new adapters, new adapters for Office 365. If we look at our user input through user voice, the, one of the top 10 asks is connectivity with Office 365. And so now in FeaturePack 3, we're building in support for Office 365 mail. <coughs> Contacts and calendar. And we'll give you a preview of that. So this morning we were doing a couple of things with order processing. We were setting an initial order where we would update uh, the system of record, which is an IBM mainframe. And we would process an a authorization hold. So the humongous size of the t-shirt is much more expensive than the little tiny t-shirt that we had in stock. And so we had to put a hold on Matt's account. We couldn't do a back order without that. So we did. And we did that by sending a message down from Logic Apps using the connector for BizTalk. And we'll look at that up here. And this is an example of one that I set up that's a one-way, but we also have the ability for Logic App to make a request reply down to BizTalk. And I want to point out, for those of you that haven't used the Logic App connector for BizTalk, it has a couple of uh, key, uh, really cool uh, features. One is you can take a JSON message and you can convert it to XML using a BizTalk schema that you've uploaded to the integration account. So you can take your BizTalk schemas and your pipelines out of the BizTalk server and use them in Logic Apps. It's really, really important and very powerful. And this is a schema that I generated in Visual Studio for the BizTalk adapter for DB2. Also, it has the ability to take a response message from BizTalk and convert that <laughs> from XML to JSON, okay? And again, using a schema as input, a schema that I've uploaded to my integration account, okay? So really important to note that, very cool capability. Let me just process a new order here for a second, and we'll go in and we'll do that first initial processing. The order ID is 20,002. Let's see if it's done yet. Okay, let's process through the system. So I'm making an HTTP call in this case to a different logic app than what we used in the demo earlier. This is going to be a receive trigger in HTTP and logic apps. It's going to use the BizTalk adapter for, um, or excuse me, the connector for BizTalk, convert from JSON to XML, send the XML message down to BizTalk, and we receive that down on the BizTalk server receive location for logic apps. 
and send that over through orchestration to the BizTalk adapter for DB2, Sales Response Send Port, and process the store procedure on the host side. If I rerun the query, we should see another order here. And use the right keystroke. Ta-da, really actually does work, okay. And then what I was having problems with earlier, because it was the Mac, I was trying to use a function key without the function key with, but a function key, is the F11 key to scroll to the right, gotta love the mainframe, right? And there's that 007 user account. All right, so this is impending status, and then just to show uh, the other part of the, the demo we had earlier, and then to get to the, the new stuff, is I wanna take that order 2002 and just complete that order. So I'll, again, I'll call an HTTP trigger in Logic App. It's going to post a message to Service Bus. BizTalk Server is going to go up and read that message from Service Bus using this receive location that I've defined in, in, in uh, BizTalk Server. <coughs> again, map it to a, a different uh, solution response send port for DB2, process the different store procedure. and it's in complete status, great. So the other thing that we did is, rather than rely on Logic App to send confirmation email to the customer, Matt, is we used, oh, I don't see the email. We used the uh, new uh, BizTalk adapter for Office 365, and here I just took the raw XML response from the DB2 adapter and sent it out an email uh, to this user, Valerie, sent it to me. Thanks, Val. Yes. Cool. So how do we do that? Let me turn the mic over to Valerie and let her give you a early look at our development and process of these Office 365 adapters. Val? Yeah. So what I've done here is on this machine, I've got the, uh, an initial build of Feature Pack 3 installed. So it has the Office 365 adapters. So you can see that if we uh, head down here, you can see there's the Outlook calendar adapter adapter, the contact, and the email. Now, the uh, calendar is both a send and a receive. The email is both send and receive, and for contacts, it's to uh, create a contact, and we send that to the uh, email, and, and a contact will be created for you. So what I have today is I've got uh, a demo here with both the email send and receive. And, uh, and I can show you what the, um, uh, the calendar configuration looks like, but I wasn't able to get this beta version working to actually get my calendar entries, so. So we'll start with uh, sending email here, and uh, for sending the email, my send port, Is, uh, is here, and, and when I use the drop-down box, you'll see that I could choose the Office 365 uh, calendar, contact, or email. <coughs> and then into the configuration, I, uh, there's a sign-in that'll uh, allow me to pick an account. Now, I've done this before, so it's already asked me, is it okay to use your account? So the screen doesn't come up that says, hey, BizTalk's going to be using your account. Is this okay with you? And you have to go through all, um, uh, okaying that. So uh, the defaults here, I'm going to uh, send this to uh, to Paul. So as Valerie was showing, we're using OAuth to get into Office 365, and we've implemented this through a new service that we've attached to Enterprise Single Sign-On. It's used to configure the endpoint with a static OAuth configuration. Right. At some point in the future, we'd like to improve the BizTalk adapters that do know OAuth, <laughs> like this adapter, and allow you to use Single Sign-On and map credentials for each call. This is like one of the first, time, first time in a long time that we've shown you some preview technology like this for BizTalk, right? That's how quickly we're moving, right? That's right. 
Maybe not so quickly. It's getting harder and harder now as we add more and more functionality through this um, feature pack model as opposed to shipping new releases every couple of years. It's actually kind of challenging. The integration testing, we get the, the features working together and then trying not to break anything, right? Remember Jim Hara mentioned this last year. The feature pack is designed to be uh, upgrade in place, don't break any existing functionality. And it's, it's been a challenge, I'll, I'll admit that. And then as you've noticed, we also come out with a queue of updates soon after the feature pack and then reship the feature packs. Again, that model seems to work, but our, our challenge is to not break things when we're doing that. So I'm going to go ahead and send the email here. And it went out. And then were you hooked into your Outlook account on this box? Yeah, no, on this no. one. You're right. Don't read anything of these advertisements. I have no idea where they come from. They certainly have, okay. you know, unless my wife's there using my email, but uh, there's something there's, I, like stuff like has nothing to do with me. Right. Cheap first class black shirt. I don't really. <laughs> I have real air conditioning. I don't need a ductless mini split air conditioner, so I don't know what that is. So, uh, but you can see that the email went out to him, <coughs> and uh, uh, then the other one is. Uh, Receiving emails, and let's see, that one's, that one's actually running. So it, uh, if I go in here to email received, you can see I've got a lot of emails here. This is set up to receive email off of my own Microsoft account. And uh, so if we look at the latest email that was received, it should be that test email that um, is the, it'll only show the body of the email when I'm using the file adapter. You can get all of the other envelope information and the, like the subject if you do this through an orchestration, you, you get that other information. But this was uh, uh, the, what the body of the email was that, we, that I sent out because I dropped this file here. This is the note, uh, notepad, the, just the text file that I had dropped into that email. That's really cool. Hey, thanks, Sanjeev, so, to the engineers yeah. for making that, make that yeah, work. Sanjeev, sending and receiving emails. Sanjeev, Sanjeev's engineers have been working on this, and I kept pressing them to supply me with a, a version that I can show you guys. Um, we'll take a look at the send port for sending the email. And so for this, uh, it sets up some defaults of who you're going to be sending it to and then the subject of the email. And then in the message part itself is where the, when I drop the .txt file. And then for receiving the emails, The configuration, oh, good. That's by design. We want That's to make sure you know it's not ready for you to play with right now. <laughs> That's right. You have to have a few of those in there. OK, well, Did we it's say not, beta? It's, it's, it's not alpha. It's not beta. Go. It's beta that you'd already have it, right? That's it's, right. It's pre-release and internal. That's right. Um, let's see here. Why is the natural inclination to start dancing right now, singing or dancing? Uh, So more than one way to skin a cat. This is what um, the uh, receive email configuration looks like. So if we'd gone into the existing one, it would have already shown my account there. And I wait for just a second, and I can tell it which folder I want to receive from. And then uh, starting it, by default, it'll start like from right now, but I could put this back away so that I could start it from a half hour ago or whatever. And I can also choose whether or not to do unread mails only. And then there's post actions there where we can mark the email as read or we can delete the email. There's a question. Uh, the email, will, will that still exist in your mailbox in your office? 
if if I don't, yes, it'll still be in my mailbox because here, this is that's exactly what this post action is. Is if I choose delete, then it'll delete the email from the mailbox. Or if I choose mark as read, then it'll if it was an unread email, it will do that. I mean, I have chosen to take all my emails, not just the unread emails, but there's all these different settings. Now here the folder uh, shows up that by default it goes into the inbox uh, folder, but you can go down here and you can choose whatever folders that, that you've got set up in your email. I've got lots of folders set up here, so. It's, it, it does keep track of that so that if I, if I stop this and then I start it up again, it'll start up from the, the last email. So, oh, yeah, we're going to have to do some testing on that. <laughs> so the question was if it was 500,000 emails, um, uh, exactly what's going to happen there. So Sanjeev, Sanjeev knows. Yep. So the short answer is that, yeah, sorry, it's similar to the FTP receive side, right? Where we have this guaranteed read once mechanism. And yeah, we'll, we'll do some scale testing and we'll certainly document uh, the limitations and then we'll see how it works in, in practice, right? And then lastly, we've got the uh, calendar adapter. Okay, so for the calendar receive, it's like real simple. So uh, I put in to uh, sign in to the account again. That should look similar. And then uh, it'll come up if I have other calendars, I could choose those. I mean, I've just got the one calendar set up. And then it'll return back things that are starting within 15 minutes. And then as this runs, then a calendar event that, that is occurring like at 2.30, it would show up then at 2.15. It, mm -hmm. it gets uh, brought in by the, um, uh, the adapter. And you can set it up, uh, well, here it shows up to one week. So that's, that's what those configuration panels look like. Cool. Thanks, Valerie. Yeah. Really neat stuff. And, and thanks to uh, Sanjeev and Valerie for getting this early preview. Good job. Yes. You would be surprised just how many separate engineers are working on these features. And the, right. when we're in the phase now where they're trying to complete their test case development and run full test pass each and then integrate all this stuff together. And it's really, really challenging as you start integrating in together. And just in case the demos didn't work at all, maybe connectivity <laughs> problems, back to our VMs. Although your VM was running in the local UK South no, data center? No. Back? no. Okay. So we actually <laughs> use a lot of our VMs now, unless they're physically in our office or on one of our machines, they're also in Azure. But the Azure data center is in the US. So, so we've been running everything that we're showing you using infrastructure as a service, much like the bulk of our, you, our customers and are doing as well. So, and I want to talk a little bit about that in a moment. Like right now. So following FP3, we're, and concurrently right now, we're working on Cumulative Update 5. So we're talking about what we're currently working on. We're working on Feature Pack 3, working on Cumulative Update 5. And we've gotten some of this work done already, such as the GDPR support, and then uh, corollary to that in the US's FIPS, and then US accessibility. So there's a lot of UI changes we've made. 
There may be some issues remaining which we'll document for the US government, but we've got the basics done there so we can say we're accessible. With regard to running uh, clusters of BizTalk server, groups of BizTalk servers, and also running it in uh, Azure IaaS VMs, is the support for cost-effective deployment into groups. And that, that is through uh, running multiple databases per SQL Server instance. And that's something we couldn't do before. Limitation in SQL Server 2016 for the most popular clustering mechanism. Not the failover clustering instances have been around since, well, that's been around since the, before the turn of the century. But the, the SQL mirroring and the, and the new capability that's replaced that called always on availability groups. There was a key limitation in always on availability groups. And that is you had to have, because of the cross database transactions that we have in BizTalk Server, you were limited to one database per SQL Server instance. And that, that's infrastructure cost, but it's also real license cost as well. And so I'm proud to announce that the engineering team is delivering support for SQL Server 2016 SP2. And that allows you to run multiple databases per instance of a SQL Server. And that's really going to help you, our customers, and partners working with our customers to deploy more cost effectively uh, BizTalk Server. And then lastly, CU5, another key thing in here is transport layer support 1.2, um, TLS, um, transport layer security 1.2. Again, a requirement for US government FIPS certification, but also something that most of our customers are rolling out as a, as a requirement by the end of this calendar year. Similarly, for the separately packaged but, but um, combined license with BizTalk is HIS 2016 CU3. Again, accessibility, FIPS, GDPR, SQL Server 2016 SP2 for enterprise single sign-on. We patch enterprise single sign-on and ship it. We, we ship enterprise single sign-on with BizTalk and with HS package, but it's, it's patched separately. We've done some testing for this. One of our resident experts in terms of uh, SQL Server deployments and, and um, VM deployment is Samuel Kasberg, who we introduced earlier. He's my go-to guy, and uh, he's here this week, so we can talk about some of the um, additional challenges to running this in Azure and how you handle clustering and uh, limitations of DTC, that sort of thing. We'll cover those offline. And then also for HS 2016 CU3, we have the uh, support for new IBM platforms, uh, SAP, Oracle, TIBCO, Microsoft, IBM. They don't ship when BizTalk server ships. You know, they're not even synchronized with our feature packs. And so we add support for new foreign platforms uh, whenever we can, in this case, a CU3, the new DB2 in the mainframe, uh, MQV9, which is about for just about a year now, and then the Kix uh, V5R4 in the mainframe. Something important to note, uh, if you go to the website for marketing, you won't find a whole lot up there, but that's okay. Uh, documentation still remains really good. We miss Mandy Olinger, she's not here this year, our great doc writer editor, but she's still with us in spirit and she does work with us from time to time. Uh, we have three PMs in the BizTalk HIS line of business adapter team. Uh, we also work on enterprise connectors for logic apps. I mentioned the MQ and DB2 connectors in particular. Chris Hauser is principal PM, Valerie, and me. So catch Valerie and I here this week, and anytime you can send us an email. doesn't matter what it's about. Question? <coughs> I was just thinking about TLS 1.2. Yes. What, what's the new uh, adapter to 2016? Uh, the new features package because the... Uh, yes, yeah, so TLS 1.2 support. The additional the stuff that you mentioned. No, um, we, we, oh, sorry, the question is what about TLS 1.2 for BizTalk Server 2016? Yes, you're right. We actually delivered TLS 1.2 for BizTalk Server 2013 R2 first, and now we're adding it for BizTalk Server 2016. Yes, good question, and I actually had the answer to that. You should always have the answer to everything as a PM after 23 years at Microsoft. Uh, with that, I want to thank you very much for your time today. I was supposed to get you back on schedule. You have an extra minute and a half before lunch starts. Thank you very much, and I look forward to talking to you this week.